Hello, everybody. I'm Dr. Minakshi, one of the mentors at Study Medic, and welcome to the Triple R series, the RRR YouTube series. And uh, today's topic is going to be sarcoidosis in pregnancy, which is the new talk article 2024. So as we always start with a quote, and you have to strive not to be a success, but rather to be of value. So let me give an overview of what are we going to discuss today. We'll be discussing about what is sarcoidosis and its pathogenesis, the clinical features and the diagnosis, and um, uh, what are the effects of pregnancy on sarcoidosis and how is the sarcoidosis going to affect the pregnancy and how are we going to manage it like antenatally, intrapartum and the postpartum management. So firstly, I want to tell you that actually there is, a, a, there is no like clear-cut guideline like how manage the sarcoidosis in pregnancy, just like how we manage the remaining cases, uh, you know, like high-risk pregnancies, if they have some cardiac disorders or if any kind of hypertension disorders, all of these, how are they being managed? In a similar way, we are going to manage this as well. So sarcoidosis is a, a uncommon disease. So the sarcoidosis is an uncommon disease. Uh, it's a multisystemic disease and the prevalence is 19 in 1 lakh. And uh, the characteristic feature of this is going to be non-caseating granulomas. And uh, the prevalence in pregnancy is about 1 in 2000 to 1 in 10. And uh, normally the age group which is being affected is 20 to 40 year old. And uh, we see that in uh, the ethnicity, the black African origin, they have, uh, uh, it's found that they're going to have more severe disease. They are more to experience a severe disease and uh, the mortality rate is less than five to 10 percentage. So in sarcoidosis, we'll be having uh, different manifestations. It can be pulmonary and extra pulmonary. Normally in sarcoidosis, they're asymptomatic, but when they are symptomatic, more than 90 percentage, they present with the pulmonary symptoms and uh, extra pulmonary, it can affect the liver, the joints, the heart, brain, eyes, and most important extra pulmonary is going to be the skin. That's the most common in extra pulmonary. So coming to the clinical features, as I just told you that majority of them are going to be asymptomatic. And uh, pulmonary sarcoidosis is predominantly an interstitial lung disease and 20% show the progressive parenchymal fibrosis. And if the pulmonary hypertension develops, it's a contraindication to the pregnancy. So this pulmonary sarcoidosis, it is actually the disease of the lungs. It is not of the airways. So what happens is that is a presenting as interstitial lung disease and that would be progressing towards pulmonary fibrosis, which is seen in nearly 20%. And in case the woman develops uh, pulmonary hypertension, then we advise her uh, to uh, not get pregnant anytime soon. So coming to the clinical features, we see that yes, in more than 90 percentage, the pulmonary involvement is seen and nearly 39 percentage or let's say up to 50 percentage, they experience cardiac symptoms and they're present with synco when they have not got any kind of prior cardiac history. And also the CNS involvement is seen in nearly 5 to 13 percentage. So coming to the pulmonary symptoms, yes, uh, what, uh, what all uh, the uh, sarcoidosis uh, patients they're present with, like shortness of breath, which can get worsened with exertion and with chest pain, wheeze and dry cough. And uh, we have got some uh, staging of the pulmonary uh, sarcoidosis, the scanning staging of the pulmonary sarcoidosis, which is from stage zero to stage four. So uh, the first thing uh, the sarcoidosis Doses is going to affect is the hilar lymph nodes. So the stage one is going to be bilar, uh, bilateral hilar lymphadenopathy. And uh, th then the stage two is this when this hilar lymphadenopathy is associated with the pulmonary infiltration. Stage three means there is only pulmonary infiltration and there is no adenopathy. Whereas stage four is going to be the pulmonary fibrosis. So what are the cardiac symptoms? So what happens is just like interstitial lung disease, the sarcoidosis can present with infiltrative myocardial disease. So about two to seven percentage, they'll be presenting with life-threatening arrhythmias. And uh, because of that, that will be resulting in sudden maternal death. And uh, it is followed by the uh, fetal death. So there will be sudden cardiac uh, death. They can have pericardial effusion. They can present with syncope or even with heart failure. So these are the symptoms of the cardiac sarcoidosis. As you can see, they can present with dizziness and fainting spells, irregular heartbeat, shortness of breath, swelling of ankles, or chest pain, or even pulmonary hypertension. 
okay that is seen uh, in around 15 percentage who are affected with the sarcoidosis so these are the uh, extra pulmonary manifestations which are being present so in case of eyes it is known to cause uveitis and keratoconjunctivitis sicca and uh, eyelid or conjunct eyelid or conjunctival uh, granulomas whereas uh, in uh, kidneys it's uh, known to cause calcium deposition with subsequent renal failure and they can be sarcoid interstitial nephritis and with sarcoidosis they present with both nephrogenic as well as central diabetes insipidus either of them is possible membranous glomerular nephritis peripheral lymphadenopathy and in the endocrine thyroid abnormalities and hypothalamic and pituitary disturbances central diabetes insipidus and uh, they can present with liver granulomas which are usually asymptomatic hepatomegaly and also splenomegaly which is less common though and um, gastrointestinal is actually rare but uh, any part of the GI tract could be involved and uh, neurological they might be facial nerve palsy and neurosarcoid as well as peripheral neuropathy and in the musculoskeletal, we've got polyarthritis, migratory polyarthralgia, as well as hypercalcemia. That is the electrolyte disturbance. Okay, that is hypercalcemia. So in the skin, uh, they can have uh, erythema nodosum, which is usually found over the shin of the tibia. But uh, the characteristic specific feature is going to be lupus perneo. And uh, coming to the pathogenesis. In the uh, pathogenesis, what happens is uh, basically there is an unknown trigger because of which there is the hyperactivation of the immune system. So what happens in the sarcoidosis, primarily we see that the helper cell activation occurs. So there will be causing the release of the cytokines like the TNF-alpha as well as gamma interferon that will be resulting in the formation of the sarcoid granuloma. So whenever there is any kind of unknown trigger which is not known, there will be activation of the macrophages as well as even the CD4 T cells. That is the helper cells. They both they will be causing an influx of these cells and they start uh, activating. That is the hyper response of the immune system because of which the cytokines would be getting released. That will be resulting in the gamma interferon causes the inflammation and uh, whereas uh, you can see that uh, the interleukin as well as the transforming growth factor beta that would be causing the uh, tissue scarring. Okay. So basically we can see that uh, there is activation of the CD4 cells and the macrophages are the ones which come into play. So how we diagnose the sarcoidosis? It is basically based on three different criteria. One is the clinical presentation. The second one is by the demonstration of the non-caseating granulomas in the tissue samples. And third one is you have to exclude the other granulomatous diseases. Like let's say mycobacterium tuberculosis. So uh, how do we go about in the pregnancy? So it is very important that whenever you are uh, doing a particular investigation, we need to be very, very careful because there is a fetus and uh, we need to be aware about the background radiation risk which can happen to the fetus. So always careful selection of the investigations, always involve the multidisciplinary team, the consultant, the pulmonologist, all of them should sit together, all the specialists, and we decide like what investigation needs to be done. And uh, judicious selection of the investigations, whether it is required, or not weighing the benefits versus risk and then we go about recommending the uh, investigations so chest x-rays are considered to be safe during the pregnancy and uh, in the chest x-rays we see that the hyalur lymphadenopathy uh, as well as the fibrosis uh, they can be detected on the chest x-ray but in case if you wish that the chest x-ray is not conclusive and if you still wish to have some more findings we can go for hrct and the bronchoalveolar lavage as well as in the transbronchial biopsy but whether you want to go for these investigations or not is the decision which is taken by the team so we can also go for MRI. Normally in non-pregnant, they take the serum ACE levels, which is done for the monitoring of the disease, but we do not do it in pregnancy. And uh, we can see that we can, uh, in terms of like cardiac sarcoidosis, we can go for ECG or uh, the echocardiography and even cardiac MRI can also be taken. But uh, we see that in pregnancy, the gadolinium contrast, whichever is there, that might cross the placenta. So therefore, you need to just see whether it is uh, uh, currently required or not. And based on that, we can go about for the investigations. And um, for neurosarcoidosis, we can go for MRI brain as well as even the electromyography. And um, when you want to go for the tissue biopsy, the histopathological confirmation of anything, that can be delayed uh, until after the pregnancy. So what are the effects of the pregnancy on sarcoidosis? Like how it is going to affect? So normally what happens here is during the pregnancy, we see that there is an immunological shift from TH1 response to TH2 response. So what happens uh, here is uh, uh, because of the immune shift, we see that normally what happens here, there is an exaggeration of the TH1, right? So we see that the helper cell one, there is an um, increased um, 
response. So because of this, what happens? Because of this immune shift, there is probably an immunosuppression over here. So uh, they also say that probably because the corticosteroids are also increased during the pregnancy. So because of that also, probably it's getting suppressed. That is also one of the theories which has been postulated. But we can see that similar to the other TH1 diseases, uh, as we can see, uh, the uh, flare of the sarcoidosis, it is expected to occur in the postnatal period, that is during the puerperium. We can see also because the corticosteroids levels also would come down and also because the immune shift also returns. So because of that, we see that probably during the postpartum period, there could be a flare which can be expected. So what are the effects uh, that is uh, telling is, uh, uh, that is told is we have preeclampsia, preterm delivery, increased rates of cesarean section has been found. And also there is an increased risk of postpartum hemorrhage as well as venous thromboembolism. It is considered to be one of the risk factors for the venous thromboembolism. And in the fetal uh, risks also, miscarriage and uh, fetal growth restriction. There are a few studies which say that stillbirth is there, but there are a few studies which say that there is no increased risk of stillbirth. In miscarriage and uh, fetal growth restriction, uh, uh, it is uh, said that these are other risks which are associated. So this is the uh, uh, the uh, uh, diagrammatic representation of what uh, is the effect that is taken directly from the talk article. So as we can see, the effects of the pregnancy, uh, majority of them we see that they can be improved during the pregnancy because of the reduction of the response of the TH1. And um, also we see that either that would be improving or there will be no change during the pregnancy. And uh, in case pre-existing, the, before the pregnancy, if they've got severe disease, then definitely there's going to be an increased risk as well. So as uh, we have just discussed regarding the fetal effects, yes, definitely there is an increased risk of venous embolism. Uh, and also increase in the risk of the pre-eclampsia. So as you can see, this is uh, nothing but we can see that how the pregnancy is going to be affecting the sarcoidosis. Either there is an improvement or there is no change in majority of the cases. Whereas how the sarcoidosis is going to affect the pregnancy is these all the risks which are associated like venous thromboembolism, fetal growth restriction and free clampsia, also increased rate of cesarean section as well as in the postpartum hemorrhage. So how do we go about the management of the sarcoidosis in the pregnancy? So we can see that the... Uh, as uh, it was told that the obstetric management, it should be involving only multidisciplinary team. As in how we are going to take this management, like how are we going to manage this in the pregnancy? Currently, we have not got uh, like good information. The information is very scarce. And uh, like how we relate, to, just as I told in the earlier part of the class, that wherever we treat, like how we treat the other diseases, let's say the cardiac disease or hypertensive disorders, like how we treat those high-risk maternal conditions, in a similar way, we are supposed to treat this as well. So uh, in the management part that can involve like how do you go about in the preconception period and as well as during the pregnancy and the delivery. So in the preconception period, it is very important that you have to optimize the disease and involve the multidisciplinary team. So taking the uh, pulmonary function test as well as all the baseline tests like full blood count and liver function test, serum calcium, ACE and uh, urea electrolytes and ECG, all of this are in the preconception period. That is the reason we are doing even the serum ACE as well. Women with the suspected or the confirmed diagnosis of the cardiac sarcoidosis should undergo an ECG to exclude the structural disease. And if there are palpitations, then we have to use the 24-hour ultra monitor. So preconceptual optimization is extremely important. And um, so normally what happens is sometimes in case uh, we see that there could be any kind of like flares, then what do we do is we have to go for the high dose oral corticosteroids that can be given. And um, once, uh, you know, the flare repression is achieved, then we have to go for the maintenance treatment. That is where we give the lower dose of corticosteroids in order to like first cut down that flare, we have to give high dose corticosteroids. And once uh, there, it, again, there is a flare repression, once uh, it is achieved, then we have to go only for the low dose corticosteroids for the maintenance therapy. Okay, disease modifying drugs can be used for both disease suppression as well as even the maintenance. So what are the different disease modifying drugs that we can use this? We'll be discussing shortly. So uh, why, uh, why are we using the corticosteroids uh, for the suppression dollars? We see that there is actually no additional risk of either fetal growth restriction or preterm delivery, nothing like that. But only thing is that there could be an increased risk of gestational diabetes mellitus. So that is the reason we'll be going for an OGTT, that is the oral glucose tolerance test. 
And then we've got another drug, uh, the medicine that is the azathioprine, which is safe in both the pregnancy as well as the breastfeeding. So we've got three different one is the methotrexate and the leaflunamide as well as mycophenolate. All of these three are not considered to be safe. So why they are contraindicated, it's a big no-no is methotrexate can cause miscarriage as well as structural problems. Mycophenolate can cause uh, microtia, facial clefts, micrognathia, miscarriages, as well as fetal growth restriction. Whereas leaflunamide, actually there are no proper human studies regarding the safety profile of the leaflunamide. So therefore it is best that we can avoid giving that. So the mycophenolate, if the patient is already taking that, it can be stopped at least six weeks prior to the pregnancy. And for methotrexate, you can stop it four weeks prior to the pregnancy, at least. And where methotrexate is stopped within four weeks of conception, high-dose folic acid should be continued until 12 weeks of gestation. And uh, if the pregnancy occurs on leaf lunomide, it's important that the drug needs to be stopped and we give something which is called as the cholestyramine washout procedure. Okay, and we have to consider the referral to the fetal medicine unit. So these are extremely important points because they consider to be teratogenic. We need to stop it appropriately. And in case she is conceived on that, then it's important that we take a fetal medicine specialist opinion. So we've also got the anti tna factors like adalimumab as well as infliximab. They are commonly used. So what happens is it is known that they could cause some neonatal immunological effects. Okay, They could cause some immunosuppression because of which if the woman is on such treatment, we usually avoid giving live vaccines to the newborn. And um, uh, so what uh, they have suggested is because of this effects of the immunosuppression, which is a, which it is causing on the fetus, they cause the discontinue. They have recommended the discontinuation of the infliximab after 20 weeks and adalimumab after 28 weeks. These are all extremely important, can be asked as SPS. So it's very important, especially related to numericals and all in part to MRCOG. Wherever you find numericals, it's better that you write down and have a glance at least once because you have to just go through them because you never know that they might ask some numericals or they might ask these questions, you know, like uh, how or when uh, it is recommended to stop and, uh, you know, that uh, they could give a list of vaccines and probably they can just ask like which needs to be avoided in the newborn. We never know. So such questions can be asked. So it's important, especially whatever is highlighted, make sure that you have to quickly go through all of those slides. And um, see, uh, but they also tell that maybe it can be given and... Uh, uh, there is uh, no much of the risk which has been noted. So actually it's a bit conflicting, but most of them, they do believe that you can continue it throughout the pregnancy. But of course we have to see the risk versus benefit and then we can move ahead. So obviously the uh, how is the management going to uh, depend? It depends mainly upon the stage of the disease and it also depends upon the uh, presence of the complications and the level of activity. So what kind of complications are there? What is the stage of the disease? Okay, how severe it is? The management would be mainly dependent upon that. So as we just told that during the pregnancy, majority of them, they usually easily breeze through. They will be asymptomatic and uh, they will be having the disease suppression throughout the pregnancy. And uh, do not forget to involve the multi disciplinary team. So in the preconceptional, as we told that optimization of the management of disease is very important and we need to perform all the baseline tests which were just discussed and uh, in case the woman has had pulmonary hypertension or severely active disease or a heart failure, it is better, better that we uh, advise her to avoid uh, planning any kind of pregnancy. Okay, and the cardiac sarcoidosis has got a greater maternal risk as compared to that of the other forms of disease. So it's very important that the absolute contraindications are, yes, definitely the pulmonary hypertension and uh, disease being very active and when there is heart failure or, uh, you know, in these conditions, we usually ask them uh, to avoid planning for pregnancy. So in the antenatal period, what are we going to do? When they've got a history of sarcoidosis, they need to be managed under the high-risk care. Now, they've got an increased risk of development of preeclampsia as well as fetal growth restriction, so we can go for the prophylactic aspirin. And uh, normally, for the prevention of the uh, preeclampsia, the usage of uh, the calcium as well as the uh, vitamin D supplements, uh, you can avoid giving all of those because in sarcoidosis already there is hypercalcemia, there is this electrolytic imbalances, there is abnormal calcium metabolism. So in order to avoid further worsening, we avoid giving those supplements. And serial fetal growth surveillance needs to be done and regular monitoring of the blood pressure as well as the urine for protein is also recommended. 
So just as discussed, there is an increased risk of having the uh, venous thromboembolism. So active sarcoidosis is considered to be one of the risk factors for the venous thromboembolism. And uh, we go for the assessment, like fortnightly assessment would be done from 24 weeks onwards, followed by weekly assessment would be done for the woman from 32 weeks onwards. And um, in case there is any kind of like palpitations or tachycardia, most important, do a thyroid function test and 24-hour holter monitor and also do a cardiac ECG needs to be done and also see whether the MRI is required or not, depending upon the uh, severity of the clinical presentation. So intrapartum, how are we going to go about it? So we see that whenever they've got like, uh, if the, it's uh, found to be like, as such, the sarcoidosis, we directly do not go for a uh, cesarean section unless there is any kind of other obstetric indication. So we, uh, how, when are we going to deliver it? There is no standard time because we don't know like, what kind of complication they might develop in the pregnancy. Suppose they got preeclampsia, we might have to go for an early delivery, right? So we don't know. It mainly depends upon her coexisting factors, which are present during the pregnancy. That's when the delivery time would be uh, discussed, okay? Would be planned. And um, in case they've got like active disease that would be requiring a more therapy, then in such cases, the early delivery can be considered. And... Um, uh, as such, the sarcoidosis uh, is not an indication for the cesarean section, but it depends upon the respiratory as well as the cardiac compromise. In case if any, then this all needs to be taken into consideration. It's important that you give a holistic approach whenever you're discussing about the plan and the mode of the delivery and the timing of the delivery and the shortening of the second stage of labor. And in case of neurosarcoidosis with increased intracranial pressure, it is recommended that we don't go for vaginal delivery. It's an uh, absolute contraindication. And um, in interstitial lung disease, we see that uh, intrapartum uh, oxygen can be given, you know, and um, also it's important that we do a proper fluid management, especially, uh, you know, in case of uh, interstitial lung disease. So as you know, do not precipitate any kind of heart failure. So as such, uh, uh, let me just summarize, there is no uh, clear cut indication that when you have to deliver and what you have to, like, what is the mode of delivery? But yes, in case of neurosarcoidosis with raised intracranial pressure, definitely we would go about. In case they're having any respiratory cord uh, cardiac compromise, in such cases also we'll be going for a cesarean section. Okay. And in case of any co complications such as developed during the pregnancy, we might go. But otherwise, uh, we can prefer a vaginal delivery as well. Make sure that if they're having the interstitial lung disease, we give the oxygen as well to the mother. And um, also, uh, careful fluid management, optimize the fluid management to prevent the risk of the heart failure. That also needs to be taken care. And um, in the postpartum period also, because now the immunosuppression effect, which is beneficial during the pregnancy is gone now. So there could be a risk of flare up. So involve the MDT and see what best can be done. And uh, also we need to discuss about the contraception so that the optimization of the sarcoidosis can be done before she could plan about the next pregnancy. Okay, so this is a very uh, small topic and uh, there is uh, nothing very specific or something new that uh, needs to be learned uh, in this. But of course, there are a few points in terms of like numericals or in terms of incidence or prevalence. Okay, and uh, symptoms, everything is very similar to uh, uh, other conditions which we usually see and the management also. Just we need to be a bit more careful. Like uh, if you just go through this once, uh, it would be uh, more than sufficient. Okay, I hope this is clear and uh, you all have... Uh, uh, gain some knowledge to this session and uh, i will see you all in another one and uh, do not forget to subscribe to the channel thank you bye